Good morning. Welcome to our breakout session. My name is Chen Zhuo. I'm the Google Development Technology Promotion Engineer. I'll talk about how can I make you application compatible with Android Oreo. As a developer, you and the application should be compatible with the latest version of Android. I've talked about two things. The first, what are some of the best practices and experience? And second, I'll talk about some breaking change in installing Aureo. You need to adapt your codes or adapt some of your configurations, talk about some backend limitations. There are some data that uh, in March, in the middle of March, when we published the first preview of Android Oreo, we found out some of the Android applications in China, only 60% of them are compatible with Oreo, but compared to the global level and Google Play, that 90% of them are compatible with Oreo, so we take a lot of uh, efforts. Working with OEM, I'm top level application developer and third party SDK provider and the cloud testing platforms. We have done a lot of work in this. We see that when Android Oreo was launched, its final version on August 25th in China. The first 1,000 applications, they already have 93% of compatibility at the end of October. When Huawei publishes May 10 uh, with Android 8, for the top 3,000 applications on Huawei application store, the first 3,000 are compatible with Android or Oreo. On um, Chinese market, the Android Oreo compatibility has already reached 96%. So I have some experience that, for example, do not use non-public API because the non-public API for the later version of Android version, you need to change its function signature or its parameter list or delete it or change its behavior. So you have very strong reasons to use non-public API could tell us. We can collect these reasons and provide some public API to allow developers to get access to them. For Android Oreo, we have the memory DEX class loader. So you can directly load the DEX in memory without any trees on the disk. We also have other experience, for example, do not call DEX too old because it's an internal way in turn for Android if you call DEX too old. So the generated file may be influenced. And do not change DEX or ISO file. It's better to use Android Studio or some of the editor profiler to directly generate DEX or ISO file on NDK. We have some checking items for Android 26. If you ETF for each part, they tell me that the dynamic iteration will give you the relative authority. We have another layer of check. So the editable and actionable, the memory options should be opposite. If you change SO file and you do not choose either or, you just W and E at the same time, then we generate uh, an arrow. In China, Android ecosystem have a lot of third party SDK, especially strengthening or the heat recovery framework. So they have some private API. So if you have the new version of Android and you use the SDK, that may crash. So I also contact with SDK provider when there is a preview on Android O, we'll be working with them to allow the SDK to be compatible with the latest version. And then for the China's loophole, 
it has been discussed in China's developer communities, starting from Android 5.0, if your application only used the Android SDKs, you use the another type of signature mechanism, then they will use ART to execute a malicious text file on December 4th in the safety alert where they recover this and fix this. So for the user, they should update the safety patch even if there is a malignant text file and placed ahead of APK, but Android system will rightly execute the expected code for developers use VE signature, you should use the VE plus V2 signature mechanism and Cradle IPK. You can open the settings to load a V2 signature mechanism. It will protect all the codes in APK, not only zip. So the attackers cannot place malignant uh, next code when you have done with the V1 plus V2 signature. You can use this to prove if the result, if V1 plus V2 is true, the APK won't be attacked by the genus loophole. Okay. When we talk about uh, in Android all some of the change of behaviors for safety and privacy, for all the devices with Google Plus service second to secure Android ID based on the signature encryption key and the personal profile of user, they will return different value. So your application won't know the other other applications Android ID, but some applications, if you want to have advertisement, you need to use Google Plus service generated ad ID for the user to reset it and the query net dot cost name. The return name is no. If you want to get account, then get account authority is not sufficient. You have to use account chooser activity for the user to choose which account they want to get access to. And for alert, they have a new floating layer, a passion over layer that to be used uh, on top of all the applications, but it below some of the key applications, for example, input. If uh, target SDK is old version, and if you use system overlay, they will be automatically replaced with application overlay. And for notification, reset it to make it more direct and simple. They can use more unified way to manage the notification behavior. And for Android O, oh, they have to use the notification channels. And multi-window display is a new feature Android O. Oh, you can use the flag activity launch adjacent intern flag to tell the system that you need multi-window. But you need to be aware that when the active screen they will know it's the top of the activity tag because it may be placed in another window. The multi-window switch is the same with switch of screens. For a standard UI modules, they won't have a problem. If your application cannot support multi-window, you can use resizable activity equal to false, means you do not support multi-window. And O also support extra long screens, some of the Manufacturers start to launch extra large and extra long screens, but sometimes you have the wrong assumption of the width and length of the screen below Android 7.1. The maximum the length and width ratio is 1.86. 
So if you make this wrong, so when application is、uh, displayed on the screen, there may be some black parts, or its touch point is not the same as UI interface, or some. So on the screen edges is wrong, and some of the UI is close to the corners that users cannot use. So I. You may refer to material design guideline to have around the 16 dp corner area. If this UI is not suitable to your scenario, if I have to set a maximum length and width ratio, I can use the max aspect ratio equal to 1.86. So the max aspect ratio is 1.86. Some of the backhand check and the limitation and the location. We have such limitation. We don't want to destroy the application or to add some extra burden to you.、We、want the Android user to be better system health and the performance experience, and the, they can provide the functions you want. The backend cannot start the service, but for frontend you can do it. And we do not support some of the invisible broadcasting registered in manifest. These two limitations. There's a piece of good news. When the application's target SDK is old, you'll be influenced by the bad news that the user could enter the system setting and to limit your the ability of the app working backend. And thirdly, some backend application will be limited in acquiring its location. All the applications working on Android O, no matter what its target SDK is, they will be limited by it. We have to fastly solve that issue. So we have overview of the backend limitation with our those profile to make CPU to the backend the window and X stand by. We do not have active interaction will delay its、uh, backend network, and in Android O we do not allow. The static connectivity for posting, you cannot action new pictures or action new video, and for Android, it will do not support the static、uh, invisible broadcasting or some backhand service, some backhand location. So these limitations, we try to limit that when the device is not actually used to limit its backhand activity. So backend activity can only be activated when it's necessary, and it need, needs to be very efficient. How do we differentiate front end and back end? The easy way when your application have a visible button that is a front end, so you have an activity is started or resumed. That is a front end. Otherwise, it will be back end. To be specific, other than the visible applications, when you service from the front end, you have a lasting visible notification, or you have a bounded service that the client application is on the front end, or have a content provider, and you can get access to its client application. Then it's a front end. We have some special services there are front end as well. For all these that、uh, they do not have、uh, backend limitation, because you are not actually in the background, but if you、uh, do not have a visible application where you start a service, the working on background. A job service and broadcast receiver. These are background. Then the system will have some background limitations. Then what are some of the background limits? Starting with service. More important thing is that the clients should be able to see that when they 
making some actions that consume resources that the users should be aware of that if they have uh, try to start the service in the background, they will fail that the start service, whether it's in the foreground, it doesn't matter. We just see whether the service, whether it's a foreground or a background, or if you're spending time, it doesn't matter, but the fail notification will appear in the log that you can start the service in the foreground, but when it's uh, in the background, it could run for several minutes. When this period ends, if it is still up and running, there will be stop we used to call it undestroy. So that the service, that the applications call service stop self. Sometimes the application will be temporarily added to the blacklist, uh, whitelist to allow it to have to start its application. In several seconds, it will be regarded as foreground, so it can start a service in the background. For example, as high priority FCM message to put relevant application in its temporary whitelist when you receive SMS or MMS or notification action when the user interact with a notification bar and uh, activate its related pending time. And then the targeted uh, application will be put in a temporary whitelist. So it, they won't have any influence on its application for the foreground, they do not have such limitation, but they should have a continuous notification for the user to be aware of its actions. The old way of starting a foreground service from the background will no longer work through. So we give you a new API. Service can start in background and promote to foreground. That uh, we do not, as a developer, you should uh, design your application well. When it's visible in the foreground, you can Call start service. So these changes only apply to started service, but responded to other type of services. Then won't have limitation when your application is at foreground and responded to other service. The other service will also be at the foreground, but can use other types of bounded signal to change such uh, behavior. That for, you can refer to job intent service. That is another category for Android. Oh, any, a lot of cases they can replace intent service when the user did not actively interact with the application. I don't want the application to run for a long time issues use a job scheduler or job dispatcher to run on background so the user can more effectively call such work. And for the limitation of broadcasting at the background, that uh, the application that uh, target all class will no longer receive any implicit broadcast through receivers declared in their manifest. A visible broadcast means they have their target uh, receiver. For example, that the application cannot use manifest to register a receiver to get action package replaced implicit broadcast, but they can receive the explicit action my package replaced can use the job scheduler job with uh, appropriate constraints. There are some exceptions of the implicit broadcast to reduce disturbances, and there are some of the necessary part for the core functions. For example, boot completed. A lot of uh, applications need to know the system is activated. Locale change rarely used, and headset plug is when user need to respond to this work. The developers, what you should do, you can use a Firebase cloud messaging. They use JMS call support for high priority message. They will wake up the 
the application and will not be influenced by low battery model and the usual priority message. You rely on the OS to make uh, the schedule of jobs. I do not abuse this. And also in the new version, we have used the job intent service v4, support library to replace the intent service because it understands the, the new logic behind the new systems. That's why there's, it uses job scheduler and query O plus and uh, the old version. It understands the background limits. When we are trying to use wakeful broadcast receiver, it should be like this. It's not safe to start a service from the receipt of a broadcast, not in foreground. Instead, we need to use job scheduler to schedule a job. And this does not require that the app hold a wake lock until a while doing so. The system will take care of holding a wake lock for the job. Before, maybe it's like when you send an implicit broadcast, when it is broadcasted, a lot of uh, services are trying to grab the resources and the system would have to kill them. A lot of the apps would be weakened in those situations. But now with job, um, the system can schedule intelligently, which reduces jank. Now let's talk about the uh, location gathering limitations because we found that one third of the Android users telling us that battery is something gives them a huge headache. And we know that the location gathering is an application that really consumes battery and it reduces user experiences. And we believe this is bad thing for the user, for the developer community, and for us as well. So the location gathering function is something we need to take care of more carefully. So that's why we've added some uh, limitations. When your application is on the foreground, you can freely gather location information. But while your application is at the background, only a few times an hour is permitted. And also, because that we know that the location gathering is based upon the device. So no matter your SDK version, as long as it is installed on the device, you have that kind of uh, limitations applicable. Use a batch process could have more backend background location information, but the time gap between each time of gathering is still the same. And sometimes we found that the GPS is super accurate but expensive in terms of electricity. Wi-Fi is better but still expensive. We've made this better. Now, no new location computation will be performed when the device stays connected to the same static access point, which indicates the user hasn't moved much from their previous locations. And also, uh, this provides significant battery savings when user is at work or at home with Wi-Fi connection. If you always stay at office or stay at home, you don't have that kind of uh, location change, so the battery could be saved quite a lot. And also, in terms of geofencing function, it has been improved. In Android O, its latency the, responsi the responsiveness uh, increased from tens of seconds to two minutes, but the power consumption is ten times more efficient. You could still use pending intent get service, but it only works on the foreground, not on the background. So probably you need to use pending intent get broadcast, and you need to state and declare a receiver in the manifest and use explicit broadcast. So some developers says my business logic requires background location gathering. What should I do? And here I do have some suggestions. One, in your common strategy, you should consider using geofencing function. So when you have uh, that kind of location change, you can have the accurate location. And with that, you'll be able to know how do I 
uh, use the geofence transition locator and to schedule FLP updates. Batching could also help because it gives you that historical uh, data. Although still within our, within one hour, there are only a limited times of a location gathering, and it's not very particularly accurate. But now, with a little bit more uh, latency, you could get more data points. And here's the code to set up batching. With such short code, you could have it. Use set interval to set the time interval. And if you use set max wait time, there will be a longer time gap, and the system would leverage that time gap. Every 10 minutes, the system, within this example, I mean, to every 10 minutes, the system requires the location once, but every 30 minutes, the system would get three answers from the server. So this kind of batching really helps. And location services would use opportunities to give you location information. For example, your uh, application is at the background, and other applications are on the foreground, and that's an application requiring location information. So that information would be shared with your application, although while your application is at the background, it is not allowed to get location information, but it can still get it from other uh, applications on the foreground. And this is the code to do it. Set fastest interval. So that's the fastest interval setting up while there's an, another application on the foreground. Should we always use this? Yes, basically it's free. And probably after you get the location information, your computation power, uh, there's some excess, extra uh, consumption of uh, energy. But still, getting the location information here is totally free. So we strongly recommend you to add this in. All right, after talking about Android Oreo, based upon such considerations of user experience, we would also like to suggest you consider your previous versions of applications strategy. For example, the frequency of gathering geological location. We hope you could make a little bit constraint on it and also make some compromises in terms of responsiveness and find that balance between it with accuracy. High accuracy and low accuracy. Like medium accuracy gives you the location accuracy within streets or blocks. High accuracy really uh, energy consuming, but necessary to some extent in some particular situations. Of course, previously what I've been talking about only for the background and on the foreground, there are no limitations, but absolutely please use it only when it's really necessary. All right, previously those are the backend changes with Android Oil. Now we've uh, united together with the Jiejing team and initiated this bug finding program on Android official document. And now if you are a developer willing to join us, please scan this QR code and help us to improve the quality of the Chinese document of Android. Thank you.